there we go. Okay, the reason for the walking stick is there are steps down there. I'm 88 years old and I've not yet had a senior fall. And I thought it'd be very embarrassing to fall either going up or going down here. So I'll hang on to the, uh, to the stick up here. Uh, again, the, the sermon this morning is titled The Craft and Art of Loving. And let me take a moment to explain that. Woodworking is a craft. The woodworker knows about the kinds of woods. The woodworker can use tools to shape the wood. The woodworker can knows how to finish the wood, varnish, wax, or whatever. Embroidery is a craft. The embroiderer knows about the kinds of claws and threads, knows about the various needles that are used to create the pattern, and knows how to stretch iron or whatever the finished product. Art goes a step beyond that. The person, the craft person follows a pattern. The artist creates the pattern or design. In a similar way, someone skilled in the craft of loving applies it according to a set of rules. The lover as artist is able to create new and wonderful ways to apply the rules. With that as background, let me get into a bit of autobiography. I was born to two German parents in 1933. My father was 40, my mother was 36. There had been a previous pregnancy, but that girl had suffered severe spinal bifida and died. So I was a special case. My parents combined to provide me with a wonderful preparation for life. My father emphasized the intellectual. He bought a 20 volume set of something called the Harvard Classics, which was a collection up to 1930 or so of all the great works of literature and philosophy and such. We also had a two volume encyclopedia and a book titled World Facts. That was an early version of Google, by the way. Uh, in other words, I was indoctrinated in the art of finding and using information. My mother, meanwhile, during World War II, got a job working in a local ice cream and deli store. Eventually she worked her way up to manager. At age 14, I went to work washing dishes. I was too young to be legal, but she might have to make sure I was, I knew how to work. At 16, I started digging ice cream and slicing ham and sausages. Now, an example of her work ethic is that on a cold December night in Cleveland, Ohio, with the snow blowing outside, the store was open, there were no customers. So what we did was got the big ice cream, metal ice cream containers out and scraped them. Uh, when that was done, then we got the all stuff off the deli shelves and we cleaned the deli shelves. So I lived my life since then knowing that there's always something to do. And that rings in my ears all the time. I lived my life since then knowing that there is always something to do. With my parents, however, there was no love. That is no expressed love, no hugs, no real affection, but the intellectual and work training stood me in good stead. After coming out of college, I went to work in aviation in an engineering department. Engineers are notorious for not being emotional, but with my work ethic and brains, I got ahead in the world. My wife, Yvonne, taught me how to love. That included her large Greek Orthodox family. I was divorced at the time, and Yvonne and I were very good friends, so I felt obliged to attend her father's funeral. I sat towards the back of the church and had fully intended to bug out after the service was over. However, I was accosted by one of her aunts and told that I had to go to the family home uh, for the, what happened after the service. I went to, that, to the house and upon entering the door, I was immediately accosted by Yvonne's aunt Maxine, known as Auntie Max. I was offered something to drink. I was dragged around and introduced to everybody, uncles, aunts, and cousins. By the end of the event, I was a member of the family. 
and that included a lot of hugging and handshaking. Yvonne has continued my lessons as we have li lived and grown together. I owe my present state to her. That's more or less where I come from, a late bloomer when it comes to love. If the word love is too much for you, by the way, we could substitute caring for or caring about someone. It could be for a partner, spouse, friend, colleague, or sometimes even a stranger. When it comes to the topic of love, there has to be some distinctions made. Parents love their children and children love their parents, but they have to. There's no choice involved. Adolescents and young adults fall in love, romantic love, but again, they have no choice. They're impelled by social needs and sexual needs to do that. The lovers have to love and they have no choice in it. There is something called mature love. It occurs when an individual loves herself or himself and has no need to be loved by someone else. That person is free to love. That person chooses to love and can love anyone and everyone. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. In stark terms, it is possible to choose to love someone whether loved in return or not. First, let me say that to be free to love others, I have to love myself and I might have to forgive myself for whatever is in my past. I have to go forward without too much emotional baggage and I need to minimize my expectations for the future. I have to have the attitude that whatever happens will be okay. All that implies a willingness to live in the here and now. As a side note, there was a time many, many years ago when marriages were arranged by parents or relatives and the pair got together and got married and then had to learn to love each other. An excellent example is something we just went through over in Great Britain. And that is Elizabeth <coughs> married Philip and shortly after that, ascended to the throne. They learned to live together and I believe they loved each other. And of course, as she said, Philip was her rock. Now, the well-known psychologist, Eric Fromm, wrote a book called The Art of Loving. He makes a number of good points in that book. He suggests there are three activities needed to become adept at loving. They are discipline, concentration, and patience. Discipline implies simply being, doing what needs to be done. It takes discipline to master a craft. Concentration for from is what we would call mindfulness today. Patience is, is needed because this is a matter, not a matter of falling in love, it's a matter of practicing the skills over and over again. But from ducked the issue of practically, what do I do? Now at my age, I need help with that sort of thing. And I did it earlier also. I need to spell out the skills involved in the craft of loving. When involved with a loved one, the craft involves number one, being fully present. Number two, listening intently. Number three, responding directly to the other person and using appropriate touch. The first skill is to be present to the other person. That means ignoring distractions, whether inside your own head or from outside. And let me say that if you sit down with somebody and you really care about them and care for them and you feel distracted, it's better to say, this is not a good time. Let's try it again some other time. It means establishing eye contact, perhaps leaning forward, frowning or nodding or smiling as appropriate so that you indicate that you are involved with the other person. Prom noted that people must engage in conversation, do not listen. Um, Paul Simon wrote a song many, many years ago called The Sound of Silence, if you're familiar with it. Now the sound of silence was actually the chattering that went on in the world that had no meaning. Uh, what I have found, and before I 
learn much about listening is that when we engage in conversation, usually what we're doing is trying to formulate what I want to say after you're done. And that's different from listening to what the other person is trying to say. In fact, the listening involves several skills. Number one, it's not interrupting the other person. That's pretty obvious. But asking for clarification, what I heard you say is this, is that accurate? Reading back or, back or summarizing what you've heard. If appropriate, taking notes. And in some way showing that you've actually heard what the other person said. At the right time, it's important to respond to what you have heard. Again, the response is directly to that person, not what you're thinking or whatever. You might do that by stating that you've heard or can see that the person is happy or sad or upset or whatever. Any response should be about the other person. Never respond by talking about your own situation and your own experiences. Never respond with judgment or evaluation. Just the facts, ma'am or sir, is what you need to focus on. Respond with an attitude of humility. Finally, there are times and situations that require appropriate touch. It may be as simple as putting your hand on the other person's hand, maybe a hand on the shoulder, and if appropriate and permitted, a hug. My good friend, Dwayne Carr, was a master of the hug. There are skill elements of the, those are the skill elements of the craft of caring and loving. They can be practiced at any time and with anybody. If necessary, you can role play those. The intent is to make attending, listening, responding, and touch come naturally. Now, do I search? Do I dare to suggest that we could do some of that practicing right here at the UU? Once the craft skills are honed, then you can move on to becoming an expert lover and an artist. That simply means being creative as to when and how contact occurs. It could be a very brief and simple greeting. Yvonne has mastered the hug and kiss around our house. And we do that frequently and more or less spontaneously. Now, it isn't necessary to make appointments to care for somebody. We can care for each other over coffee at Main Street Bagels, or even in a car eating a Wendy's chocolate frosty. A last suggestion, occasionally you and I and others need to take a love break with friend, partner, spouse, or significant other. It is a time to be together for the purpose of loving. Such a meeting has a simple agenda. How are you doing? Here's how I'm doing. The love break is needed because like a continuing life is a continuing process and we change over time. The condition in which we live changes over time. We love today, what we love today may be different from the way we loved a month ago or a year ago. Loving and caring aren't all that difficult if we're willing to put aside ourself and our ego. Well, actually that can be very difficult, but nevertheless, if we can, then we need to pay attention, listen, respond, and touch. And may all of you have many loving times in the future. So um, thank you, Ernie. And what we what we do here traditionally, Ernie, is um, after the sermon, I'll go ahead and allow people to unmute themselves. And if they have a comment or something they'd like to say, mm -hmm. um, we'll have a, a few minutes of uh, conversation with you back and forth, if that's okay. Sounds great. All right. So I forgot to explain how we do this. But if you would like to uh, say something, just go ahead and unmute yourself. That's uh, the direction to me that you'd like to say something. If you don't want to say something, stay muted because otherwise you're going to get called on. So, and I believe that, yeah, people are able to unmute. Elizabeth, go ahead. Thank you, Ernie. I really enjoyed that. It was just such a wonderful combination of hearing a little bit about your life and then words of wisdom and 
I, I really like the idea of a love break with an idea, you know, and also the idea of a, the craft of love and then the art of love and how those can be different. So you gave me some a lot of inspiration and wonderful things to think about. Thank you for talking today. Yes, and I have a problem. I, have, I couldn't wear my hearing aids because it, it, oh. it and so I'm trying, having trouble hearing this. Maybe. She said, Elizabeth said, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I love you. And I, I really appreciated, you know, the, the idea that, that, that to, in order to love, we need to practice and also listening. We need, we need to practice listening and that there are certain, you know, certain steps to take in listening to practice. And, and I like your idea of bringing it to UUCGV, but, but I think that the, the, that that is something that is done in covenant groups that we've done before, because there are certain guidelines we have for listening and speaking in our covenant groups that, that really focus people on listening. So, so that's something that we actually have done in the past and, and maybe we need to bring those covenant groups back so that we can all practice listening again. But thank you for that sermon, it was wonderful. He, he liked the point about practicing. Yeah, that's very important. Anybody else with some thoughts? Well, um, thank you, Ernie. And why don't we go ahead and close out with our closing hymn this morning? And I don't have it in front of me, so I'm not sure what we're singing right now. I think maybe let this be a house of peace. Yeah,